Hello Booktube, a video that's been a year in the making, uh, and hopefully maybe it won't be a year in the uh, editing. Uh, it's my 2020 books video, uh, where I do a kind of a little bit of a review of, of books in my books in 2020. Uh, it was a tough reading year because of, hey, this little thing called the pandemic kind of definitely mucked about and there's a, there is that theme in some of the stuff but surprisingly I um, seem to have gotten through um, an okay number of books <laughs> for the year. I won't bother you with numbers because I doubt if I have an accurate number anyways. Um, so I've got a couple of categories here that I'm just going to run through to try and kind of uh, squash myself down. Uh, I've got uh, the most forgotten books, uh, the least liked books, uh, the books I most wished that I had actually uh, reviewed at the time I read it. And because I didn't review it then, I'm probably not actually going to review it now. Um, my favorite books, uh, a brief discussion about series, because I did a couple of series, uh, some of which I reviewed over extensively and some of which I didn't review at all. Um, and then I will finish that up with uh, the top three books uh, of my my reading year on a completely subjective scale, which, of course, you know, it's booktube. Everything is subjective, except if you're Steve, in which case you're just objectively correct. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. OK, let's start off the categories. Let's start off good, negative, least liked books. Um uh, least liked books in no, no particular order. Uh, Zombie Fallout uh, actually. Uh, Speaking of Steve Donahue, uh, he was talking about this series by uh, Mark Tufo, and I picked up the first one in the series, and I found it cram full of kind of macho bullshit uh, and uh, some some fairly glaring kind of point of view uh, errors, what I thought were errors, and just the the, the kind of the, the 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 macho bullshit just sort of outweighed sort of you know some of the fun. Fun bits of it. I, in the end, it was just like, okay, I read one and I don't want to read any more of that. Uh, number two was uh, The Space Adventures of Kirk Sandblaster, which actually I heard on uh, Dane Cobain's channel. Uh, this is not me dissing uh, these guys because, you know, hey, they've actually steered me really well uh, in years past and in other bits of this section. But, you know, sometimes things just don't hit. Uh, for The Space Adventures of Kirk Sandblaster, it's it is a uh, Douglas Adams uh, Hitchhikers to the Guide to the Galaxy um, um, pastiche, um, a kind of a it, it's 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 a spacefaring uh, comedy where uh, Ollie Ollie Jacobs has definitely read uh, um, Douglas Adams um, more seminal work and doesn't really do it that well. It's kind of, it's pretty choppy and. Um, what is there is definitely just sort of a faded carbon copy of Douglas Adams. So yeah, just not my thing. The third one, third and final one that'll inflict my negativity on this, this, this world uh, is a uh, black Mesa uh, number 14 in the Ranger series by Ralph Cotton. It is a Western, definitely rest Western true and true uh, where uh, Arizona Ranger Sam Burke goes on. What kind of amounts to an hour of television adventure? Uh, and, um, you know, that in itself is, is, is fine, but it was just like, even for an hour of television, it would have been completely by the numbers, unsurprising. Like the, the, it had just had one of those plots where it did not veer off of, um, what you expected to happen happened. And I just found that so boring. I think I, I picked this up, uh, in the library audiobook stuff and it was just like, it was just so, it was like, it was very competently done. Uh, unlike, un, un, unlike, uh, uh, Jacobs and, uh, Tufo, this is a, this is a pro. This is a guy who has been writing for a long time, knows what he wants to do. Maybe it's also, I'm just not a part. I, um, you know, in science fiction, it's like, oh, it could be a tried and true plot and I'll enjoy it because I love science fiction. Uh, for cow, for Westerns, I probably was, it's a, I'm not, I don't have that built in affection for it. Therefore, I found it really boring and really disappointing. So yeah, that is my least liked books of, uh, of, um, of, of 2020. I don't think I had any hated books. I just least liked, um, most forgotten books. Um, this is the, this is the category when I look back and go, Oh, 
I can't remember anything about that. So I'll have, I'll be pretty light on my summaries here. This isn't to say they're bad books. They're just, they weren't memorable books to me. Um, for me, I've got, uh, two. Uh, I've got The Changing, but Changeling by Victor Laval. Um, a, uh, kind of an urban, it's urban, it's urban fantasy in the sense it's uh, kind of our real world. Or maybe it's because we're, we go a little bit more literary. It's liter magic realism, but let's, we'll just call it urban fantasy, uh, which kind of has a mixture of kind of examination, examination of, of, uh, kind of racial politics. Also with men's rights. I don't know if I actually found that it actually, and mixing it with the kind of the idea of the changeling, the, uh, the child switched, switched at birth, the uncanny child. I don't think I found it that, um, it like that it particularly gelled. And I guess maybe the, one of the signs I don't feel like it particularly gelled is I can't remember it at all. Um, and one native life, uh, which is a nonfiction kind of autobiographical work by, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Wagamese, uh, a, uh, uh, native Canadian writer. Um, these are very, these are all kind of like short little pieces put together. I think I heard about it from Sean, the book maniac. I've got a theme here of dissing books. that <laughs> book tours have, have said, wow, I love this book. Um, I found after a while, because they're such short pieces, I found that they, he actually kind of reminded me of, uh, if you're a certain age of, uh, Andy Rooney, who was a commentator, I think on 60 minutes and he would do these little video essays. And at the end, he'd have like a pithy one liner of like, you know, that would sum everything up in a little moral, a moral. And well, I don't know if he's, it's quite, quite as pat. I, I did start to find that formula, uh, kind of, shining through because you had so many of these multiple little, little essays all the way through. There was some stuff that was like really interesting about Richard Wagamese's life. Uh, you know, someone who definitely kind of, you know, as a native person in, uh, in Canada started off really hard and actually kind of, you know, was able to kind of overcome this and become a successful author, become, um, you know, someone who's like, you know, high, highly respected. Uh, but I just found that there was a certain kind of a, a tone and that there's a certain kind of a, kind of a dad tone of like, you know, you kids today, this is what you should do. Kind of like that, that sort of thing. It, it, it did not, I, 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 I'd sort of, I, I remember the stuff I did, don't, didn't like, and I've sort of forgotten a lot of the kind of the positive things where there were positive things there, but, it's, it's slipping away. It's slipping away. So, um, okay. And then the books that I actually really did like, and I wish that I had reviewed that I wish that I had reviewed in 2020, but for whatever reason I didn't, there's a lot of, there's actually a good, good hunk of books, uh, actually in my reading that I never got to a review for, uh, just because probably mentally I was just not there for 2020. Um, the ones that the ones that come up are uh, La Rose uh, by uh, Louise uh, Ed Edric er Erdrick, uh, uh, Na Native American uh, author. Uh, this one set on a North Dakota North Dakota um, reservation, where uh, at the very opening of the book, uh, a child is accidentally shot and killed. Uh, and, um, kind of the solution that it comes up with is that they're the child of the fat from the family of the shooter, uh, goes to the, the family who is really broken up, really messed up, um, to kind of affect some, tr to try and affect some kind of a healing. Uh, and that's La Rose. And, um, Ed Edric, uh, does a, does a thing of also kind of skipping back in time to all the other La Roses in this, in this family, uh, kind of giving you kind of just a really rich portrait of, uh, of, of, of these people, of this world, of the kind of the history, um, you know, doing that thing that I think literature, really great literature can do, which is like make you actually immerse you in this world and really get a good sense. And, um, I was really struck by, um, you know, there, there's characters in this book that you that start off you think are quite despicable, but as you go along, it's like, oh, you get to you get to know them, and like you know, their actions haven't changed, but your understandings are deepened. It's like a, that was like that was a, a really a real highlight, and one that I wish I'd reviewed at the time. And another one that I wish I'd I had reviewed uh, this year is Broken Slate by Kelly Jennings. Uh, I actually this is a re this is a reread for me, which makes it doubly frustrating that I did not actually. Get get to to review it uh it's 2010 uh uh very uh in, indie uh, uh, uh novel um where it's set in the very far future on this planet roman planet uh called planet julian uh which is very much set up on a kind of a roman 
uh, kind of a Roman system where uh, we follow Martin uh, Eduardo, who at the age of 14 was enslaved by uh, the uh, this this culture. Uh, her his his family was you know flying around church, is enslaved, and uh, this is a very hard hitting, brutal book on uh, the kind of the nature of of slavery. Uh, Martin ends up in uh, relationships with uh, various lords, males uh, in this thing, and has has these really kind of um, twisted, uh, terrible power dynamics, dysfunctional power dynamics with these lords. Uh, and it's a really good, um, it's a, it's a really good portrait of a society that is twisted by the, this contract system, this slavery system and how it is uh, brutalized and twisted both, uh, both uh, the enslaved and the slavers of this society. Um, it's less of a, less of a kind of a plot as it is kind of a character study that way. Um, uh, Jennings has come out with, uh, another book, um, which I probably didn't write down, but I'll put right here, which is actually, it takes place further in the future, different characters yet again. Um, and I was sort of waiting, looking for that, waiting for that book to come out and it actually has come out. So, uh, now that I've reread, uh, broken slate, I'm looking forward to reading the next book in this series, even, even though it is one of these series that it is so hard, brutal to read that, uh, afterwards you feel kind of that shaken, that kind of, that kind of, uh, sullied by it. Um, that it's, um, it probably did take me that long to, uh, come back and reread it again, but it, it, it's, it's disturbing uh, and it should be, it should be disturbing. So yeah, that, that's broken slate. Uh, the final one, uh, we'll go with the Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. I did, uh, the great God of Pan, uh, a while ago. Uh, and this one, uh, is kind of delves into the same kind of, uh, pagan, uh, unconsciousness stuff. This one is actually semi-autobiographical. Uh, it was published in 1907 and, uh, shows a writer, who uh, kind of gets exposed to kind of pagan visions at this Roman fort. Uh, and, um, you know, it seems to be like a road not traveled by Mackin of somebody who kind of descends into further and further kind of uh, uh, visions and delusions and self-isolations. Uh, it's got that just kind of the dripping with kind of atmosphere uh, and kind of clotted, clotted prose. It, it's like one of those things that you're going to have to kind of enjoy that kind of thing uh, to uh, get into that. If you're like your clean minimalist prose, do, do not try. Uh, Arthur Mackin is not the dude for you. Um, so yeah, that is the, probably my most wished, wished I'd reviewed uh, novels of the thing. Um, I was going to pick like, what's, what was my favorite re what was my favorite review or the one that was like, I had the most fun doing uh, this thing, not most successful. And I think that was probably during shake tube when I did Venus and Adonis, which um, you know, it's just, it's one of Shakespeare's long poems. It's a, uh, it's a uh, problematic as the kids say uh, with its views on uh, kind of uh I don't know if you court, courtly, courtly love, romance, uh, you know, a lot of non-consensual uh, stuff going on in this poem, um, a lot of horrible kind of power dynamics going on in this in this poem. Uh, it was just it was uh, I, I, I loved I love kind of getting in and kind of really digging into that poem. Um, and I also loved uh, the conversation that I got uh, kind of from from that uh, uh raws at Scaladan dandling about the books and others uh just like kind of having a discussion about this work it was like ah that was that probably that whole experience makes that my uh, f most favorite review of 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 the year for myself um i did a heck of a lot of series uh during during 2020 uh this is uh, ten books of the uh, ten books of the Barsoom novels of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, a science fiction fantasy planetary romance on on Mars, uh, with the I adding a movie uh, and Gulliver of Mars, and I'm still reading at the moment uh, Journey to Mars by Gustavus W. Pope, a exposition heavy uh, book, which you know I'm wading my way through at the moment. Uh, you know, it's starting out with kind of a trilogy of John Carter at the beginning with Princess of Mars, Gods of Mars, and Warlord of Mars. Um, probably, I think one of my favorite favorite of the series has got to be kind of the Mastermind of Mars, Synthetic Men of Mars, bit of it with uh, Raz, Th Raz Thuva, Thova, 
what's the hell, Raz, Raz Thava, um, mad scientists swapping bodies, but also in synthetic men of Mars, there being a vat of grow, uh, that he would grow men, thus synthetic men of Mars, and indeed swap one of the, the hero getting swapped into this horribly ugly deformed dude's, dude, dude's face for that. Um, uh, and also just a vat, a vat of, of, of organic matter that's spreading out, spreading out, spreading out and is in danger of like engulfing the entire planet. It was just like such a, such a fun series, such fun, such a fun series. I might at some point come back and do number 11, which is really the only Edgar Rice content in there is like one story. One story in there is actual Edgar Rice Burroughs. I might come back to that, but it seems like such an afterthought. I don't know. I don't know. My other uh, big series that I talked about again and again on the thing was uh, the standalone trollops, which I, uh, this is a series, this is a lonely trollop series, which is, is a creation of uh, Steve Donahue. Um, Steve Donahue started off this series of lonely trollops and uh, went for a good, a uh, bit of good pit a bit of the year. I think there was like uh, the way we live now, American Senator Claverings and Mr. Scarborough's family. Uh, I all co- kind of read along with Steve and uh, all of us, uh, Don, all the Don Uites. Um, and, uh, you know, really, really enjoyed that. But he kind of bowed out at, at that point. And uh, I continued on. I wanted a whole year of, uh, of, of Trollope novels. Uh, so, uh, the editor's tale, cousin Henry, Mrs. Mackenzie. He knew he was right. Lady Anna and Orly Farm. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was just such a joy to kind of immerse myself in, uh, Anthony Trollope, a uh, very different writer than Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, you know, big chunker novels, uh, stately, uh, in a way, uh, always kind of humanistic, always never, never looking for the cheap action plot stuff or anything like that. Or, uh, I mean, Mr. Scarborough's fam- family, I kind of grin at that now, uh, thinking about Mr. Scarborough and his, his kind of fiendish little plots to uh, stymie uh, the uh, laws of entailment of, of inheritance and and poor creditors and stuff like that. Mm, creditors, you know, kind of painted in, in se- kind of semi-racist ways, but that's also what you get when you're reading uh, a, a Victorian novelist of, of that of that century. So uh, yeah, yeah, another fun. Those are my two big, my big series. Uh, also, also uh, in there, some some ones that I did not review. Uh, there's uh, the uh, Alona Andrews, which is a husband and wife team uh, combined to be Alona Andrews. Uh, the, her Hidden Legacy series, of which I read uh, four of the novels of this uh, kind of alternative uh, world, urban fantasy world, where there's uh, where there's um, where there's magic, where there's where there's magic in this thing from a super serum that was created in the 19th century. Uh, but is really it's all about the romance, and we have. We have three sisters in this Fata family, a Nevada Baylor, uh, who has in the in the first three books has got this romance with uh, 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 Rogan uh, Connor Mad Mad Rogan, uh, and in this in the in the second bit of the series now we're we're getting Katrina with uh, Alessandro, uh, the sexy Italian prime. Uh, it, it, so it's a it's a fun magical world, but it's mostly about romance. In some ways, this series is sort of reminding me of it's the um, it's the female version of Edgar Rice Burroughs of, of like, yes, there's adventure and stuff like that, but there's also the romance though. Actually Edgar Rice Burroughs is also full of is, it's always about rescuing the princess though in a much more chaste, chaste manner, uh, a manner that, you know, is, is early, not early, early, uh, uh, 20th century versus kind of hot and sexy of, uh, the, uh, of the, of the, you know, of, of, uh, the 21st century. Good Lord. Um, so yeah, there was that. Uh, I read a couple of Jim Butcher books. I think I I actually reviewed I reviewed one Skin Games, and then the next two I didn't review. Uh, they were uh, Peace Talks and Stormfront, which are basically one book put together. One's all set up and one's all battle. Um, also fun junk urban fantasy uh, with uh, Harry Dresden, the uh, the uh, sorcerer, a former kind of. Um, uh, hard-boiled detective uh, uh, wizard, um, you know, but that's, he's he's grown and grown, and now we're getting world, you know, 
the Titan is, is is attacking and there's all this sort of battles and stuff like that. It's I don't take the series uh, I think as seriously as uh, some, <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm there for the fun. I'm there for Butters and his lightsaber and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, fun series. I, I can see why I probably didn't review it because I think it's number 16 and 17 in the series. And it's like, okay, fine, fine. Ooh, ooh, talking about series. That's something that I wish maybe I had reviewed. I also read Joe Abercrombie's The First Law Trilogy. Uh, uh, before they were hanged, uh, The Last Argument of Kings and something else in there. Uh, <laughs> another one, all three, one, two, three, uh, of, of the series. Um a really, really good, se- a really tight kind of fantasy series, uh, kind of um, mostly kind of sword and sorcery, but kind of treading on high fantasy, uh, very much kind of like a comment on stuff like Conan, uh, hero or serial killer, because uh, Logan, the, Logan is the bloody nine, definitely serial killer. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the magician in this book, uh, is the wizard in this book is like, okay, if you were an immortal being, how would you actually view, uh, mortals? Uh, you would probably view them like this guy does. And it would probably, you'd probably be as scary as this guy. Uh, none of this hands off. I'm only here to nudge things in directions of kind of Gandalf. Um, but I think the thing that like, you know, there is all that commentary, but actually the thing that makes it not just a derivative no- Tolkien, uh, knockoff is that this is, uh, it's maybe it's the combination of we've got kind of Conan in here. We've got Lord of the Rings in here. We've got the, just the kind of the, the grim dark, I guess, uh, you know, George R. R. Martin and, and, and other folks like him who are very much kind of going for the earthy, gritty, kind of psychologically realistic, um, with, with kind of real politic, uh, real politic happening in here. Um, but it is such a tight series. It is only, Okay, brace yourselves. It's a fantasy series. It's only three books, and it tells a complete story. I mean, I know Joe Amber Crombie is maybe doing another series in this, but this, this, this three, this first law trilogy, it is three books, and it tells a story. And there are no gigantic long digressions. This is all killer, not just Logan Nine Fingers, all killer and no filler. Um, so, uh, if you're looking for kind of grim. Dark, um, not actually with, okay, don't quote me on this, but I actually don't think there's actually that much violence towards women in it. Um, because sometimes, um, uh, unfortunately, grim dark means, well, if we want to show that we're realistic, we're going to show women being sexually assaulted in these books. There's actually not, uh, a trem- not a tremendous amount of that. There is a tremendous amount of talk about torture. Uh, there's a tremendous talk about kind of the, the, the the consequences of living a horribly violent l- lifestyle. I, I think uh, someone like Logan Ninefingers, who is sort of a Conan in a way, uh, is kind of a good kind of a good thing of like, yeah, you if you survive long enough being kind of a Conan figure, you are despised by enemies and friends alike, and they both they all fear you, and they're not wrong. You you find out as you go along in this series. Um, yeah, yeah, real. I, I, I'm really, really thrilled to have uh, finally gotten around to Joe Abercrombie. I'd heard a lot about him, but I was like, oh, grim dark. But like, wow, three books that tell one complete story. I, I can't uh, enthuse so much about that. Usually, it's three books. Like for Brandon Sanderson, that's just him clearing his throat to start his uh, 17 book series or whatever the hell it is. Um, so yeah, yeah, okay. Let me go on to my top three books, though we'll get some other stuff back in here. We'll come back in here. My top three books of the year, I think, looking back. What did I, what did I enjoy the most? Um, what were my top reading experiences? Uh, sometimes this won't mean that they're maybe the best books ever, but they're the top three books to me. Uh, I think I'll start off with number one, which is Clearing the Plains, which happily, uh, has a connection to another booktuber where I'm not shitting on them. Sorry, everybody. Um, yeah, um, I did a buddy read with Sean the Book Maniac of Clearing the Plains, which is a nonfiction book, uh, talking about, uh, it, 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 there's a, there's there's a lot of background in it, but basically the the crux of the book is how the Canadian government 
uh, starved through pol- policies of starvation, uh, um, cleared the Canadian plains for uh, the opening up of uh, Canada, for the creation of Canada, how uh, we st- this, they dishonored uh, treaties and they starved Native people uh, out, out, of, out of the plains onto reserves. Um, and uh, I think this is just like, it's, it's an important book to me, uh, just as it was just such a solid bit of, uh, scholarship, um, with, with the evidence, um, you know, not as, not always the best, like, you know, as a, as a, as a book, uh, uh, Dastruck isn't like the greatest in the way of a storyteller, which I think is actually an important thing in, uh, not is, is as important a thing in nonfiction, uh, as it is in fiction. Because if you can't carry a reader along, but I think that just the sheer, uh, power of the material carries the book, carries the book along, uh, and made it so important to me, uh, really kind of, um, shaping my conception of the, con- of my country, the country that I live in, uh, and, uh, just, um, what actions my life, my life and the lives of everyone around me are based upon, are based upon, uh, some, on reprehensible, uh, policies and actions by my my government, my representatives. Um, people say, "Oh, that was a generation ago. That doesn't. That's not. I'm not responsible for that." It's like bullshit. If you are a citizen of a country, you are responsible for what your government does, and you need to um, you need to do. You need to you need to know about that, and you need to act on that. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was definitely uh, one of my top. My, my top reads. Um, <laughs> the second book, uh, to change subjects very quickly, uh, and I just reviewed this on this channel, is Harriet the Spy. Uh, it is a children's book fo- following Harriet M. Welsh, uh, a, uh, a budding writer who writes down everything about all the people around her in very brutal, you know, 100% truth, but with no, 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 um, not much in the way of, uh, you know, not in the way of consequences, but also maybe lacking a little in the way of empathy towards these people. She is, it's the cold, cold view from above. Um, and that book gets discovered and the, her friends are not happy with her. And, um, you know, and it's at a, it's at a time when uh, her nanny, old golly has actually left her. Uh, so she doesn't have that support and she's got to kind of work this stuff out on her own. Uh, and, uh, this was a reread for me, uh, read because uh, I was reading, uh, sometimes you have to lie, which is a biography of Louise Fitzhugh, uh, a book that posits exactly how radical, uh, this lesbian author was, uh, in her worldview and how she was able to, um, to, to slip what are very kind of, what are very kind of helpful, but could be potentially seen as subversive ideas into her children's book uh, in an artistic way, in a way that you're never, you're, you're never thinking this is somebody who is preaching to me, trying to tell me this is what you should do, kid. This is like, no, it's like, Hey kid, life is fucking hard and uh, you need to get all the information you can. And that um, look around, look around and see what, how the many ways to live. Um, yeah, really, really. I found out a really important, it was a really important book for me when I was 11, which may influence that when I reread it, I found this book equally as, 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 as important and powerful to me now. So that I have to, I have to put that down as, as one of my top books of the year. Uh, and, uh, number, number three, oh my God, I can actually reach around and pick it up is I'm going to pick uh, we, one of the other series that I read this year um, was uh, the uh, Hillary Mantel's Hillary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell series. Um, this was a series where I'd read Wolf Hall a couple of years ago and hadn't really got it, and I was kind of uncertain about whether Mantel was playing fast and loose with history. So I also read uh, I also read uh, Darmic McCulloch's uh, um, bi- bi- biography of Thomas Cromwell as sort of a along with it to sort of check on the history, make sure that, uh, uh, Mantel wasn't changing things to, uh, to suit her, uh, to suit her agenda. And it's like, wow, no, no, she was not. She was not. Now that said, one of the things about coming back to Wolf Hall this time and coming back to the rest of the series is like, I realized 
oh, but we are deeply, deeply immersed in uh, Thomas Cromwell's point of view reading these novels. Uh, and um, I think that's something that I, I got, I had a better sense of and I, I better thought about um, as I went along and actually made it a deeper and richer experience to me. And it kind of set aside those He's really being portrayed positively. It was like, yes, of course he's being portrayed positively because he's the hero of his own story. Or if not the hero of his own story, he's got all this internal stuff that he understands that color his actions. So uh, for me, though, uh, though I really love Wolf Hall, I would have to say it's the uh, second second uh, novel in the series, Bring Up the Bodies, that I um, that I thought where is Mantell really really hit it for me. Really hit it for me. Um, really going into, uh, it's not a story because like a lot of the stuff about Tudor stuff didn't, doesn't interest me because it's Kings and Queens and it's just not, it, I'm not a King. I'm not a Queen. <laughs> no, Sean might be a Queen, but I'm not, no, she's a, he's, he's an Empress. Sorry. He's the Empress of Bales. Um, but, um, but, um, Thomas Cromwell is uh, a guy from nowhere, nothing who is Doug, who, who is, who is, who has clawed his way up any way, by any means necessary. Uh, and, um, and, uh, that, and, and I think while Wolf Hall kind of sets up, this is from Thomas Cromwell's point of view. This is, I felt like bring up the bodies where it's like, oh, this is the book where you start to realize, yes, Tom, this is Thomas Cromwell's point of view, but you start seeing more and more cracks of how, uh, how terrible of a person, uh, a person who's done so many terrible things is behind that mask of Thomas Cromwell, uh, that facade, that thing of the family man, the family man who will bring people home to torture. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is, uh, I, I have had, I had troubles with the third book, uh, uh, the mirror and the light. Um, there is a readathon, uh, going on uh, this year. Uh, for the uh, Crom the Cromwell series, where they're actually also going to be reading uh, Darmot McCullough's uh, biography, which I, I totally uh, definitely go for. It's very thorough, but it's also if you're into that kind of thoroughness, you you might enjoy it, and you might just have to plow through it a little quicker. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, they're doing they're doing a readathon of this, and uh, they're taking a whole year, so. Who knows? Maybe by the end of the year, I'll actually want to reread this in 2021. Don't quote me on that, but um, this is a book that um, I got bogged down in just as the pandemic was happening. It was really was erupting at the first in, in, in March. Uh, and so I read it at a very slow pace. I felt like there were parts of it that didn't feel as digested, or I just felt like, oh God, we're doing this again. And I, I kind of, I, I, I lost the, I, either I lost the energy or the book felt overstuffed for me and interfered with me. Um, because I had so much trouble with Wolf Hall the first time, uh, I, I am very tempted to join, uh, this readathon. It's hashtag Cromwell. Uh, and I saw it over at Kim at the uh, middle of the book march. So maybe, hey, J Hey, Jason, want to do a reread? <laughs> you probably already have the book, so you don't have to buy it. <laughs> that is Jason at Old Blues Chapter and Verse, who was the great host of, uh, of Cromwellathon in 2020. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, bring up the bodies. Bring up the bodies. The rare book that I actually have a physical copy of that I can hold up uh, was one was my last of my top three books of 2020. So that is going to be a hell of a lot of minutes on 2020. I will leave it there. I hope uh, you guys you guys had, as far as books go, a good 2020. Um, you know, what were your favorite books of the of the year? What were the books that? You know, even not even if it's, like it's the best book, it's like, what's what book? Oh, just that the book that had that had you that had you. What's 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 that book? Um, and other than that, you know, my plan in 2021 is to read books. That's my big plan. So there's there. I even got I slipped in my plan video, my goal video for the for 2021 at the same time that and probably try and review more. All right. More videos later. <laughs>